Hello, my mellifluous art sluts. It's Allison Moon, and you're listening to Artgasm, the podcast all about the intersections of sex and art. I am so excited that you're joining me today with my wonderful interview with Mackenzie Peck. Mackenzie is the creator of Math Magazine, a very hot erotic magazine. It's a beautiful, glossy object to art, and I strongly recommend you check it out. But before we get to my interview, I just wanted to give you a couple of announcements and a little bit of an intro, and then we'll segue right into the good stuff. So uh, announcements. I will be in the Bay Area next week. That is January 26th. I'm going to be part of San Francisco Sketch Fest and I'm super duper excited about it. I'm going to be on the Hound Tall podcast hosted by Moshe Kasher and I'm going to be on a panel of some of the most incredible comedians that are working today including Michael Ian Black and Andy Kindler, Natasha Muse, Aparna Nancherla and me. The scrub who has no idea how she got invited to be on that panel. But it's really exciting because the whole theme is about how to be good at sex. And I'm going to be the guest expert, hopefully teaching you how to be good at sex while people make fun of me. It's going to be great. It's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, so tickets are still available. Do check it out. It's at sketchfest. That is where you can get all the tickets for all the events. And while you're there, browse the amazingly huge list of stuff. I mean, it's basically like Comic-Con for stand-up comedy because there's so many different kinds of events. And the San Francisco just gets taken over by by comics. It's a really fun time to be in the Bay Area. So it's, uh, again, Saturday, January 26th, and that's at 4 p.m. It's the Hound Tall podcast. So do come cheer by books, all the fun stuff. Another announcement, I'm going to be at the Mystery Box Show in Portland on Valentine's Day night. That's February 14th. That's a Thursday. If you're trying to figure out what to do uh, for a date night on Valentine's Day, I suggest coming to that show. It's going to be a lot of stories of romance and sex and lust and desire and all sorts of wonderful, yummy things like that. And I'm going to tell a love story, a love story that I ha- I've i told in full only a couple of places, but this is going to be a very new telling of it with a lot new of new context. So I would love for you to be there to show your support, buy some books, hang out, we can chat it'll be fun so that's again you can go get tickets at mysteryboxshow.com and i do recommend getting tickets in advance they tend to sell out and it's valentine's day so i'm gonna go ahead and guess that a show about sexy times and love is going to sell out on valentine's day maybe it's just me but i i suspect that might be the case and since we're on the topic of sexy time and love, um, I made an announcement earlier this week on my various social media outlets, including Twitter and Instagram, that I finally signed, signed the contract for my brand new book that's coming out with Penguin Random House in 2020, which feels like a million years from now, but is actually just around the corner. So the book is called Getting It, How to Hook Up Without Fucking Up. Now, granted, that title may change in the interim between me turning in the book and the book exists on the shelves. So, you know, don't hold me to it. But for now, that is what the title is, Getting It, How to Hook Up Without Fucking Up. And I wrote this book after I wrote Girl Sex 101 because I know that a lot of people needed more information about just the kinds of intricate relationshipy stuff that goes along with sex because there are a lot of guidebooks about like the mechanics of sexuality including girl sex 101 but i think a lot of the harder stuff is the emotional mechanics of sexuality and i also wanted to write a book that was for all genders all sexualities that didn't basically make any assumptions about the kind of sex that you're having or with whom but rather all of the emotions that get involved And I started writing this book a little while ago, and I finished my first draft over a year ago before I even moved to Portland. And it's been hanging out for a while, waiting for an editor to come scoop it up and give me some insight. And so now I have that editor and I have that publishing company, and we are going to get into the nitty gritty of digging into this book and making it good. What's interesting is that since I wrote it, And since the title was placed on it, uh, a lot of stuff has happened in the world of what it means to fuck up. (laughs) Uh, Me Too, for instance, happened. Uh, The movement got more mainstream. Toronto's Burke's movement uh, hit the mainstream. And I think that that's really useful. But it does mean that I have to go back in and do some more tinkering on the how not to fuck up bits of things. Um, Because the truth is, we've all fucked up. If we have had intimate relationships with anyone, 
We have fucked up at some point or another. We have had p- fucked up things done to us in some way or, or another. Sexuality and intimacy is messy, messy stuff, and it's complex stuff, and it involves nuanced relationships between different ideas of communication styles and of pleasure and of joy and of sensitivity and intimacy and revealing of deep things. Sex is complex. And I think that's what makes sex so exciting, makes intimacy so exciting, but it also makes it easy to fuck up. And I think what this moment is calling upon us to do is to acknowledge not only the fucked up stuff that's happened to us, but also to acknowledge the times in which we were not at our best and we did not treat other people's hearts and minds and spirits with all of the sensitivity and compassion that we should have. But I think in order for us to understand harm, which I think is what Me Too and this moment in cultural time is asking for us to do, to understand harm, we have to understand it from both sides, both the harm that has been done to us, but also, and maybe more importantly, the harm that we have done to other people. Now, fucking up is a range, right? I like to think that most of the emotional guh that happens in intimate, sexual, sensual relationships is because of mistakes, because of lapses of empathy, because of moments in which you prized your own agenda over somebody else's emotions, of moments in which you forgot to notice or check in or really listen as hard as you could to another person, and that you feel bad when you realize that you hurt somebody. And I think that... That is most of the problems in terms of intimacy. There are other fuck-ups, and there's a range of fuck-ups from the accidents, mistakes, I'm sorry I stepped on your foot, I'm sorry that I used that word that you don't like, I'm sorry that we're not on the same page. And then the range continues into a much darker place where you prize your own agenda over the protestations of somebody else because you don't care. But I think most of the experiences of most people have around harm that they've caused other people is pretty well within the range of, shit, I'm sorry. But I think that in order for us to be able to understand harm and in order to heal harm, we have to be able to reckon with both the harm that we've caused others and the harm that has been done to us. I think Me Too has been very focused on the harm that has been done to people, the, pe- the, the harm that people feel. And I think that is incredibly valid and incredibly necessary because that is the stuff we do not hear enough about in society. But I, I read this, I mean, Toronto Burke had just did a great interview in the New York Times, and she spoke directly to this, that the next step in the Me Too movement is healing but in order for us to heal, and at this point now I'm, I'm not even paraphrasing, I'm going off my own, I just want to acknowledge that. Uh, but in order for us to heal, we have to be able to look at all the different ways harm moves through our lives, including the ways in which we've harmed others. We cannot get stuck in phase one, which is the reckoning, right? I think it's really seductive to stay here, to feel all of the negative feelings of all the ways in which we've been hurt by people, and to kind of stew in that. I know that that is a very seductive feeling. I often feel seduced by that very thing to just stay angry, to just stay bitter, to just calcify and decide X, Y, and Z person is a predator. X, Y, and Z person is a bad person. X, Y, and Z person does not deserve love or forgiveness or whatever. I understand that. I certainly understand that. However, I think it's a mistake. I think it would erode your soul after a while to stay in phase one. Phase two is necessary and phase two is learning how to heal. To heal yourself, to heal your past, to heal your community, to heal others that you have hurt in the ways that you can, to show up, to try and, to the best of your ability, fix things. Or at least undo some of that scar tissue and help things set in a better way. And I I've very much appreciate how this movement has made me reflect on the times in which I was not impeccable with my word or the times in which I bulldozed somebody else's emotions because I wanted something or I did not want something and I didn't really care how the other person felt or the times in which I was activated and nervous and impatient and I just wasn't as sensitive to another person's needs as I should have been. 
I don't like the feeling of having to look at those moments of my life. I do not enjoy or revel in the times in which I hurt another person. But I think it's necessary for all of us to reflect upon those times and to make amends where that is appropriate. I recently sent a couple of emails to people from my past where I wanted to say, hi, I've been thinking about you. I acknowledge that I was not impeccable with my word, and I'm sorry if my agenda bulldozed your own sense of what you wanted. And if there's anything that I can do to fix this, to make you feel good, please let me know. And at that point... There may be work that can be done. There may be restitution that can be paid. There may be opportunities for coming together. And in other times, it might be that that's just going to be an open loop forever and ever, and that's just something you're going to have to live with. But I think it's really valuable for us to understand the various dimensions of harm, the various dimensions of trauma, of pain, of agendas, for us to be able to really, with any sort of intentionality, with any sort of completion, be able to look at this moment. Because I think what's really cool about this moment is that this conversation is ubiquitous. And, you know, maybe it's just through my lens, but I honestly do not know anybody I do not know a single human being who is not having this conversation on a near daily basis. And I know my, my, I am limited towards sex positive culture and sex education and uh, people in porn and people in uh, intimacy related works. I mean, I understand that my, my, my viewpoint may be limited, but even my parents, even my colleagues in non-sexual oriented places, they're having this conversation because it really does feel like it's everywhere. And I know, I know it's exhausting. I'm exhausted. I don't like having to have this conversation about harm almost every day, but I do it because I realize it's valuable. I realize it's necessary because again, if we're going to move forward as a society with any greater sense of empathy, this is the way to do it. And I think that that's what our current cultural moment is begging of us is to improve our access to empathy I think that that's, Me Too has really solidified that. I think before Me Too, it was Black Lives Matter. I think also we're dealing with that in terms of the crisis around immigration on our southern border in which we have internment camps. We are, we are being asked to, as a culture, notice these places in which we are not living up to our own ideals around empathy, where, where we are not as gracious and kind and compassionate and sensitive as we should be. And I think what's really interesting about this cultural moment is there's a lot of kind of mm, hemming and hawing and, and bemoaning this notion of hypersensitivity of, among young people. And I understand that in some ways because I know that I certainly gravitate towards the cynical and the callous and it's a part of my life that I feel like I'm constantly at war with is battling my cynicism to remain a little bit rawer and a little bit more sensitive and I'm not always very good at it because it hurts so much sometimes. But I think it's really important to do because our culture needs us to be empathetic. It needs us to see the places in which we allow harm to happen to other people without interfering or doing anything about it. And the places in which we enact harm on other people directly or indirectly. And then, of course, the harm in which we experience in our own lives all the time. And it's not just one thing. You can't divide this amongst different lines. It can't, it's not just one kind of harm, right? This is what we say when we talk about intersectionality, that the experience of harm and of of pain and of need for empathy is intricately linked to all of the big issues in our culture, race, gender, uh, nationality, immigration status, class, access to health care, access to education. These things are all inextricably linked. And when we can get better at noticing the places in which we are not living up to our own ideals of what it means to be a kind, gracious, sensitive, empathetic person, we can get better and we can learn to focus on those things. But we first have to be able to sit with the pain and the, the frustration of it. And I know it's painful and I know it's frustrating, but it's so damn important. And I think it makes us better citizens. It makes us better partners. It makes us better lovers. It makes us better friends and family members. Being willing to listen with an open heart when somebody describes pain that they are experiencing and our willingness to 
either help mitigate it or reach out and try and fix things where we can fix things, try and mend fences where we have broken them. This is all real, real essential. Which to me means I have more work to do, right? I am going to be writing more of this book. Uh, There are gaps in this book that I will be filling over the next eight months, and I am very excited to do that work. Obviously, you can probably hear it in my voice that I have a lot of thoughts and feelings about this, and that feels really good, but I know it hurts so much, so much of the time to notice those places in which we have not been as good as we could. So understanding that it's not about how not to fuck up. It's about how to fix the fuck ups you've fucked up in the past and how to help avoid future fuck ups. I know that for myself, I have fucked up in ways in the past and quite recently that I regret and that I am doing my best to try and not do again in the future. And I hope that that's what you all can experience. I hope that you all have the opportunity to look at those places in your own life where you didn't do as good of a job as you wanted to. And you can fix that. And you can at least learn from it and move forward and become a better person. That is really the best that we can do is learn how to be better and learn how to help other people heal. And through helping other people heal, I believe that we will heal ourselves as well. But in order to do it, we need to come at it from a holistic perspective. We need to understand harm. And we, we can only understand harm when we understand the ways in which we both enact it and receive it. There's no one without the other. And anyone who believes that they are unimpeachable, anyone who believes that they've never done harm, is lying to themselves or to you. I do not take advice. I will not read a book or watch a TV show or listen to a podcast from somebody who believes that they have not hurt people. They have not fucked up. That's just not possible. We all have. You get naked with somebody, you're gonna fuck up. Hopefully in small ways. Hopefully in momentary oopsie ways. But those still can hurt. And it's important for us to be able to acknowledge that, apologize when necessary, and move forward. So that's what I'm going to be working on for the next eight months. <laughs> I'm very much looking forward to it. I'm looking forward to hearing your thoughts as well. I'd love to know your feelings and thoughts about this, any ways that you have reckoned with these things for your own self, or the conversations that you're having in your communities about this very thing. I certainly hope that we are going to fig- we as a culture learn a thing or two about how to be better to each other. I think we are. I hope I believe we are. I believe we're getting better. My optimist and my pessimist are in a war constantly within my head, but I do believe that the optimist has a little bit of an edge because I believe that the march of time is making us all a little bit more aware of how nuanced and how different our lives are, despite the fact that we all pretty much want similar things, which is to say we want to feel loved, we want to feel respected, we want to feel taken care of to some degree. And I hope that we all keep that in mind, that as we get better at this, as we get better at having these conversations and listening to each other, we will improve upon our ability to do those very things. All right, there's my little 15 minute rant to start the show. And now allow me to introduce you to Mackenzie Kent. So Mackenzie, I met in Brooklyn because I was very enamored with Math Magazine. I think it's such a great style. It's so sexy. And I love, I love physical objects. Again, in this day and age, when so much of the sexiness that we receive, we receive through ones and zeros on our phone and computer screens. I am really in love with the idea of holding a physical object. And Math Magazine is quite the physical object. It's really just a beautiful, beautiful magazine. And so I talked to Mackenzie about her experience of learning how to publish and finding her way in her artistic voice and, you know, finding her way as a as an artist in this modern era of eroticism and the challenges that often come with it when we talk about things like internet censorship. And be sure to check out the show notes because Math Magazine does a lot of parties and a lot of mixers in New York. So if you are a New York-based 
sex-based artist or model, if you're interested in getting plugged into a sex-positive artist community, check out Math's website because you're going to get a lot of opportunities to do that very thing. So look at the show notes. You can find those at artgasmcast.com. And you can also follow me or find me if you want to find them on Instagram at Allison underscore Moon or at on Twitter at Hey Ellie Moon. And feel free to DM me and I will send you the links to the various events that Math Magazine has coming up. All right. Without further ado, please enjoy my interview with Math Magazine founder Mackenzie Peck. All right. I think we're good to go. Cool. <laughs> Hi, Mackenzie. Hi. How's Thank- it going? Good. <laughs> Thanks for sitting down with me to talk about your magazine and your smut and all the things. <laughs> my pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. So tell me, I mean, I, I met you through some mutual friends, like basically sex positive New Yorkers. Um, and I've been paying attention to your magazine from afar, kind of on Instagram and seeing things as they come up. And I would love to know a little bit more about just you, but also the, a lot more about math and the impetus behind it and all that stuff. So. Yeah, that's a lot to cover. It is a lot to cover. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. So tell me a little bit about, um, I guess... Man, where should we start? Tell me a little bit about like your kind of journey to get to making this kind of work. Yeah. Um, growing up, I didn't get exposed to porn very much. Mm. Um, it's I, I was born pre-internet, mm. but kind of grew up with it in a way. Mm. Um, and I remember sort of my sexual evolution Um, happening kind of in parallel with the evolution of social media. Mm. Um, Like chat rooms were a place where I experimented with um, kind of talking to strangers and flirting with strangers and testing the boundaries of like what I could do or get away with or Mm -hmm. something like that, you know? Um, And I think I must have Googled things. Mm. I don't know when Google started, right. yeah. <laughs> but you know, that's such a gateway for a lot of people sure. who are curious about their bodies and things. And Were you, do you remember what kinds of things you were Googling? The only thing I remember, it was a bit later on when, uh, like AOL was fully established <laughs> as America online. Um, <laughs> awesome. and I remember being in school and Googling phrases that were not overtly sexual, but might uh, give sexual results. Mm. Like, like the phrase, like big, bad peanut man kit comes to mind. What? Something where it was like, you know what I mean? I wasn't like Googling penis, but it oh, was like, see, maybe yeah. if we put in these, this combination of anyway. words. Yeah. yeah. Oh, interesting. <laughs> Almost. I feel like all of this was sort of like a teasing out of boundaries mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and being curious about sexual things, but not going right for it in yeah. a way. Um, in my home, my parents had a copy of The Joy of Sex. Mm-hmm. It's a very great, like, hippie <laughs> book with cute illustrations. Yeah. It's, like, pretty wholesome. Yeah, hairy people in love. <laughs> I mean... Hairy hippies in love, yeah. And there must have been some art books around, but a pretty tame introduction to uh, porn mm. um, and, like, sexual media. Um, and I think... When I discovered porn for myself as a young adult, um, I was disappointed to see that the um, kind of amazing world of kink and BDSM and this like amazing range of sexual expression that I was kind of like discovering Mm -hmm. um, was not reflected in the content that I was finding, Mm -hmm. Um, which is unfortunately still the case today for most porn. Um, So how did you discover then kink and BDSM if you weren't seeing it first? Uh, people, oh. <laughs> human people. <Yeah. laughs> um, I had this summer of sexual awakening where I think I was seeking something. I think I had a sense that there was more out there. Mm-hmm. And uh, I met all these people who kind of guided me along the way. And mm-hmm. they introduced me to things like um, the book Sex at Dawn mm-hmm. um, and Fet Life. Mm-hmm. And I remember finding the Fet Life um, map. That there was like this map of all the different kinks. It covered mm-hmm. like everything. Mm-hmm. And it kind of, it visualized it in a way that really made sense to me where there would be like a continent of things that were kind of related. Like, I don't know, like maybe it had to do with um, costumes, right? Mm-hmm. So maybe like latex and rubber and leather would all be kind of together. And mm-hmm. I'd be like, okay, like I understand like that grouping. Right. And it kind of pulled things together in a way that helped me a lot Mm. and helped me decide what I was into and what was intriguing to me. Um, 
and these people, more importantly, like the community that I found myself becoming a part of um, was really exciting and empowering. And I felt like a kind of coming home in a way. Interesting. Um, growing up, I, I sexually, I was a little bit different, maybe, and like went for relationship situations that were a little unique or, <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, as an adult, kids from my high school who I was still in touch with would be like, yeah, you're always like a little, like a little strange. <laughs> Where'd you grow up? Uh, Connecticut. Oh, okay. Um, so you were close to New York, but not yeah, influenced um, necessarily by. And my folks were from, um, Queens and, mm. um, Yonkers and, they knew the city in the 80s and before and they kind of and I'm an only child and they sort of uh instilled some fear in me about Mm -hmm. coming here Mm -hmm. um so I was a I was a pretty good kid and didn't really come to the city very much (laughs) (laughs) um but I think you know I really took porn on as something that I could make my own Mm. and a big mission of mine is for other people to do the same Mm. so what made you feel like you had the impetus or even like the the power to do that well I was going to college for art Mm. um and I was married was getting married and he his name's Justin. <laughs> and he introduced me to the power of design mm. and this idea of being an entrepreneur. Um, I feel like it was less of a common thing to talk about as it is now, which is great. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's pretty similar to becoming an artist, but I hadn't really thought of like making your own business as a reality, mm-hmm. as like a, a tangible thing. Mm-hmm. And he really like put that on my radar. Mm. And I think that opened a lot of doors for me. Sure. Um and made me see the potential for an idea like this. Mm. Um, and I definitely have a hard time working for people. So. <laughs> it's kind of interesting because like you, it's almost a parallel between like you discovering that porn, the porn that you saw in the mainstream was very limited, and also you discovering that the stories about how to make a living were limited. Like the breaking through, through breaking through porn, also kind of parallels to breaking through into being an entrepreneur. Yeah, that's really interesting. Yeah, cool. So, I feel lucky for it. Yeah. yeah. So why? So why then porn? Like at, in art school, was there? Were you just attracted to the sexual material more than other stuff? Or well, I don't think it was an obvious thing to me at the moment. Looking back, like when I was in high school, I was in love with my art teacher <laughs> and uh, <laughs> um, would just paint nonstop. Um, and I was really into Balthus and other painters who depict these really ambiguously sexual narratives. Hmm. And that was my, that was my jam. (laughs) And I was painting it and I remember, uh, somebody introduced me to the word sapphic (laughs) and there's this amazing painting of, it's like, I'm like a giant piece of wood and it's like. Uh, women in in different um, degrees of undress and the title was something something sapphic and I'm like like who's who's telling me this stuff is great you know (laughs) Um, so I think there's an attract there has always been an attraction to like ambiguous sexual narratives or situations or imagery Mm -hmm. Um, but if you had asked me in school like Mm -hmm. Like what's it wasn't even totally clear to me, mm-hmm, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, you just kind of go toward the thing, the shiny things. Sure, <laughs> sure, sure. Yeah. Um, but everything's clearer in in retrospect. So did the your um, kind of sexual awakening around finding community and finding kink and BDSM? Did that overlap with art school, or were those separate times? That was after art school. So mm-hmm. I um, was engaged, and I think I was freaking out a little mm-hmm. bit. And had a summer um, to kind of, um, I had some jobs lined up and I was kind of driving up and down the East Coast, staying with friends and stuff Mm -hmm. like that. And I had like the space to maybe process some things that had been on my mind Mm -hmm. or or something. And Mm -hmm. um, it was amazing. The the marriage didn't work out, Mm -hmm. (laughs) but I'm engaged again. So love, love lives on. (laughs) Awesome. Awesome. I think this one's going to (laughs) take. Good. So yeah, so tell me about then when did the magazine idea come to your you? Yeah, um, 
again, you know, all these little streams in your life seem to culminate in these big decisions, mm-hmm. right? Um, and I've had the opportunity to, re- to reflect on all of them. But uh, I remember, so I went to school in Baltimore at the Maryland Institute College of Art. Mm. And I was at a house party. And um, I was, my friend ditched me. So I was just kind of like doing my own thing. Mm-hmm. Kind of drunk, kind of stoned. Mm-hmm. Um, a group of women walked by me and go upstairs and I'm like this looks interesting <laughs> I want to go where they're going. <laughs> right I mean I think it was it made sense <laughs> um and uh so I follow them up and they start playing dress up and going through the closet and putting on like the ugly prom dresses mm-hmm. and whatever and and I was like a little too fucked up to like uh to get involved Mm -hmm. um but I was just kind of observing and appreciating and being like this is beautiful this is like playful and sexy and Mm non-competitive and like hot and all the things right and when I'm kind of when I'm high like I get into the artist mindset of Mm -hmm. wanting to um distill certain parts of like an experience into art or Uh something And then you combine that with this entrepreneurial mindset and this idea that maybe I don't want to work for anybody, Mm -hmm. um, that uh, I had the thought of starting a porn magazine, um, the light bulb moment, you Mm. know? And I had grown up with magazines around, like Vogue and the New York Times were always around in our home. Mm. I think that I held the role of editor-in-chief and the idea of print in, like, very high regard. Mm -hmm. And the idea of being an editor-in-chief would be like, oh, my God. (laughs) Or, like, to have the authority to decide what goes into print is so cool to me. Mm -hmm. And to be able to work with all these, like, amazing, talented people who are my friends Mm -hmm. and, like were like have an excuse to reach out to like the people I'm like a fan of mm-hmm. you know sure um, that's why I do orgasm to be right honest. it's like <laughs> this is a really legit reason for me to talk to like my idols yep 100% <laughs> um so you know the next day I remember telling all my friends this great new idea I had and you know they're mm-hmm. like yeah great what it's gonna be called math I don't get it all right yeah. you like good luck with that right? <laughs> I mean that's the thing you know you need quite a lot of um people to believe in what you're doing to, mm-hmm. to make something like this happen. Um, yeah, even just for moral support, if not actual, like... like models. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Like, will you take your clothes off, please? <laughs> um, so it was a couple years before the first photo shoot happened. So I'd say um, the idea must have happened in, oh, God, um, 2010, mm-hmm. maybe? I forget now. And then the first photo shoot must have happened um, 2013, I think, mm-hmm. maybe later. Um, took a little while in the beginning, you know, Mm -hmm. and I, I, I'll always be indebted to the first people to work with me because I had nothing to show for myself. I had an idea. I had some, some uh, concepts for photo shoots, Mm -hmm. but ultimately the idea of them like getting naked and putting these images out into the world, um, was a really trusting thing to do. Mm -hmm. And I really appreciate that. Nice. Yeah. So in those intermediate or intervening years where you have the idea, but you didn't actually make it a thing, like how were you, like, were you planning or were you just fundraising or what was the process there? I don't even know. It was kind of a blur of like, um, I lived in Berlin for a little bit Mm -hmm. with my then husband, got divorced, Mm -hmm. (laughs) tried to piece my financial and emotional life back together. (laughs) Um, it's, it's all like funny now, but at the time it was kind of a mess. Um, but You know, I think for better or for worse, I'm always trying to be very proactive in the direction of my life. Mm. Um, And I'm always kind of assessing, like, is this where I want to be? Is this what I want to be doing? Mm. And I think that those years was definitely a time for that. Um, I was trying out a lot of different things and doing a lot of soul searching. Um, At one time, I was was living in South Carolina. That's where my parents were living at the time, Mm. kind of staying with them a little bit to recuperate uh and i was working in a used bookstore on the side of the highway oh, wow. with one of those air guys like i had to i had to roll out one of those guys oh. that like i <laughs> get the flippy flippy you know? <laughs> and like take him back in and i feel like i'd probably like talk to him a bookstore like, how's it going dude i see you yeah. see there's like car dealerships so that's, that's interesting a bookstore. yeah 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 <laughs> I have lots of thoughts about the customers that would come through there. It was great. I really um, want to see an erotic spread of that flippy guy. That... <laughs> Ooh. Now you're on to something. Nice. 
Nice. You're going to art direct that one. <laughs> uh, but sometimes, you know, those in-between spaces really allows you to, like, figure out what you want to be doing with your life. Mm-hmm. Um, and And I think, you know, I kept coming back to this idea of, like, what am I good at? What do I want to do all day? Who do I want to be around? Um, how can I make money while maybe making the world a better place? Mm. Um, and this continued to be one of those ideas. Mm-hmm. Um, and then when a friend um, came around and was like, whatever happened to that idea you have, let mm. me do the first photo shoot. Mm. And as soon as that shoot came together, you know, as two models, a photographer, I was playing like DJ, makeup artist, mm-hmm. mixologist. <laughs> it was like I was – living in Connecticut at this point, getting ready to move to Brooklyn, Mm. had this basement apartment in a raised ranch house, um, working at an art museum. And we did the shoot like on my actual bed. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know what the concept was even like, you're hot, take your clothes (laughs) off. Um, and, and after that shoot, you know, it was like, shit, I have to make a magazine now. Mm -hmm. Like they were, they did this for me. And, Mm. Now I have to, like, honor it. Yeah. And I think every issue since then, I have had that feeling of, like, these people are so generous for for sharing their vision or, like, showing their bodies. Mm. And um, I want to do, like, right by them. Mm. And now it's, like, I want to do right by our readers, too. Mm. Um, People get really excited about each issue. And I'm really trying to make each one better than the last. Yeah. Um, Well, what's interesting about math is that, like, so much of porn because of the internet, I think, is incredibly like specific. You can go to any website and be like, I'm looking specifically for interracial, like barely legal slash like heterosexual. Like you can just kind of any any number of different things that you find sexy, and you can find only that porn if you want to. Like every different porn underneath that vertical of that very specific thing you're into. And what you do in the curation process, it seems, with math is like, you're just kind of like all sorts of flavors of hot, right? So even if somebody's like only into feet, they're going to get some feet, but they're also going to get like a ton of other things. <laughs> and I'm wondering, like, do you find that that's, you you have people seeking that kind of out? The, 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 the mass of it, like the, the diversity of, of sexy expression. I think so. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think people get really excited about seeing the artwork, Mm -hmm. um, and the quality of the photography and the quality of the writing. Mm -hmm. I think, um, my like unique curation of it, Mm -hmm. um, is something that cannot be reproduced, um, and certainly not reproduced on the internet. Yeah. Um, and for me, it's exciting because, um, I think our readers are, maybe into not everything in the magazine, like intensely, but I think that they're interested in learning and being exposed to things that maybe they haven't heard of, Mm -hmm. or maybe they were kind of cringy about, but uh, are open to like maybe not being cringy about it. Mm -hmm. Um, To me, it's like, well, maybe I'm not into, into a kink that we feature, but I'd like for folks to understand why somebody else would be into it right and where where they would be coming from mm-hmm. so. yeah so there is this level of and i think what this is what print does so well is that there is this level of like i can find it arousing or i can find it aesthetically exciting or both um but generally speaking even if i si- see something that is not at all something that gets me going pants wise like it, it's going to get me going intellectually or just emotionally because there's something that i can see in it that i appreciate just like art even if it's not you know for me, necessarily, mm-hmm. which is pretty cool. Yeah, I think um, it's surprising how closed-minded people can be when it comes to shapes of bodies mm-hmm. or types of bodies or types of sexuality when they can be so open about uh, art or, mm-hmm. or uh, I don't know, fashion or something. Like, like mm-hmm. I don't like that shirt, but I guess, I guess he's into it, so that's cool. Mm-hmm. Like, I hope we can spread that kind of... Um, acceptance you know um in in sexuality and and pornography sure well i mean it is interesting to like me like i'm a sex educator i talk to people about their sex lives for a living and i still find myself kind of surprised when i encounter my own internal biases around things and not like oh you shouldn't be doing that but more of a like oh people find that sexy and it's like okay like huh now i have to feel into that and i want to i want to learn how people find that sexy because that's important to my work and also just my emotional growth and I find that really exciting and when I am able to reflect upon it it's like oh yeah of course just like with Hollywood it's like when you have this one very narrow 
thing that we are saying, this is porn, this is sexy, this is what you should get, be watching to get off. And um, so that gets inside of you. It really does. Yeah. And like the Playboy model type stuff from a very young age, that stuff is kind of like, this is a sexy lady, right? Nothing else. This one is sexy. Um, and I think as an, even as a you know 37-year-old woman, I'm like still finding these places in which I've been told that this is not sexy. So I believe that this is not sexy on the subconscious level. So yeah, seeing hot people of different kinds engaged in hot things in different ways, like just does help kind of de deconstruct that a little bit for myself, which is great. We're reprogramming the mess. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, in terms of like when you, uh, the create curation process, like do you find yourself ha kind of having to do, pardon the pun, some mental math around like, do we have enough this? Do we have enough that? Yeah, I put a lot of pressure on myself and um, I do try to hit some kind of balance that I don't even know if I can articulate it. Mm -hmm. um, it's a feeling um, in terms of having a range from, you know, something that feels like vanilla, something that feels um, intro, mm -hmm. you know, um, to all the way to like niche, kink, obscure, like people don't even know this exists kind of mm -hmm. um like out there um and then body types you know um I want I want to show that the more like range and diversity we see the like hotter the whole world is mm. <laughs> like that's it's so exciting to me um and it seems like one problem I've run into is that if you don't see people that look like you in porn you're not going to feel comfortable Never mind porn. If mm -hmm. you don't see people that look like you in media, mm -hmm. you're not going to feel comfortable or welcome to to participate. Mm -hmm. um, and my job is to say, it's okay. It's safe. Mm -hmm. um, I want to give you permission to do what you want to do and to, sh to show yourself in the way you want to be seen and, mm -hmm. um, and to represent people who don't get represented enough. Mm -hmm. um, it's kind of a chicken or the egg kind of a thing. Um, you know, if we have more representation, then it will be easier. <laughs> yeah. um, but that's something I think about a lot. So how do you go about finding those people? It's hard because with porn, you can't just hit up people randomly like, mm. hey, do you want to <laughs> fuck on camera? <laughs> um, Although, you know, living in Los Angeles, I definitely had people who, all, who that would be their, their pitch. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I can be pretty bashful, you know, like, mm. like I'm a pornographer, mm. but I still get... Um, it's like scandalized or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> like I still like blush about stuff. Mm -hmm. Um so I I try to put it out there, you know, to our networks that we're eager to to work with people who don't don't get seen enough. Mm -hmm. Um and we I look for people who are putting it out there. Mm -hmm. You know, if somebody's like, I'm a disabled sex worker who um, has my own cam site uh, that I want to promote, mm -hmm. you you know, then I, then I feel comfortable saying, like, this is, like, on your career tra trajectory, you mm -hmm. know? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, if you have any ideas. <laughs> oh, gosh. Well, I mean, if you ever end up doing, like, a tour, like, because, right? I mean, I've been on the West Coast for so long. But, yeah, I mean, the, the people who are making – cool art on the west coast i mean there's there's no end um but yeah like i, I know so many sex workers and so and burlesque performers and you know people who are comfortable being naked um yeah, yeah totally i'm happy to i'm happy to hook you up. <laughs> happy to hook you up i love it <laughs> that's awesome cool so do you find that like you, have you gotten any resistance around like either there's too much of you're just showing too many different things or that you you haven't hit this mark yet of this kind of fetish that i'm into or this kind of person that i find sexy no, people are like really nice to me. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I think yeah. I think people are happy. I, I think if anything, they just, uh, people just want more. Mm. And I, I have to remind folks that it's it's like me. Yeah. Sometimes I have a, a, a round of interns helping out, mm -hmm. and um, it's a balance of you know you want to appear bigger than you are. Yeah. Um, but then the expectations that are put on you are a little hard to meet. Sure. Sure. Um, so we, I originally started doing four issues a year and I'm cutting back to two issues a year, mm -hmm. maybe with more pages. Mm -hmm. Um, and then doing like more events and more collaborations with mm -hmm. other brands. Um, so I can like take it easy. <laughs> yeah, sure. Sure. Um, or take it easier. Um, mm -hmm. 
but yeah, I think that that would be the one challenge is, mm-hmm. is just seeming like we have more power and money than, than we really do. Yeah, I found the exact same challenge because it's like, yeah, I don't know why we're supposed to pretend we're bigger than we are. I'm sure there's some sort of marketing reason behind it. But like, yeah, there's like the I'll send out a tweet about like my book Girl Sex 101 and I'll say like we wrote, like are so excited about this and it's like no I am excited just me <laughs> I have a stack of books in my closet I'm mailing them out myself I'm handwriting the package but like, there's just, truth to it you yeah. know like your brand is bigger than you mm, that's the true. magazine is a lot more than just me it's all the people involved all the people mm. who enjoy it mm-hmm. um I think it's true yeah. and, and I think it's good to put some distance between the personal mm-hmm. you and the thing that you're putting out into the world, if yeah. only for your own sanity. That's true. Um, I find a lot of safety in it. Um, you know, being trained as an artist, there's a lot of I. Yeah. <laughs> there's a lot of ego mm-hmm. in the work, and there's a lot of heart and soul in the work that, you know, if something happens where nobody cares about what you're making yeah. um, or misinterprets it, uh, mm-hmm. it's too close to your heart. Mm-hmm. Um, so weirdly, I think that starting my own company – allowed me to be a lot braver in in the sort of artistic choices that I make or the Mm -hmm. way that I put myself out there Mm -hmm. um in a way it's not Mackenzie that's out there it's it's math yeah Yeah. by the way what what is the title about (laughs) (laughs) um I think you know when I was living in South Carolina I remember the magazines at the checkout would have pieces of plastic censoring magazines that were not Mm -hmm. sexual or pornographic they'd be like a olympic athlete Mm -hmm. gold winning you know gymnast Mm -hmm. in a in a uh tank top but they would censor it you know oh wow um and it's like okay if if the female body cannot exist (laughs) period yeah um then we're just so not ready for anything that's um that's obvious, right? Mm. In, in terms of the name or the cover. So I went kind of fully in the other direction mm-hmm. of, okay, there's no, not even going to be an image on the cover, uh, one color, uh, and the name's not even going to be like Butts, Butts, Butts. <laughs> um, but Butts, Butts Magazine is actually really great. Um, <laughs> oh, it is. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I think the first thought was um, to call it like biology or chemistry. Mm. Um but it seemed too on the nose. Right. Um, I also like the letter M and mm-hmm. I like the four letter mm-hmm. name is good, solid to yeah. me. All these little things, you know, that um, that inform these choices. Yeah. There was also uh, this very brief period in porn where the magazines looked kind of like um, ju- uh, journals or mm. um academic studies uh where the cover might actually look kind of similar like it was like like art deco era like are we talking like 30s maybe yeah Yeah. Uh, i think it was pre um tijuana bibles where it was like those little cartoons Mm -hmm. uh contraband (laughs) um a little bit more like uptight (laughs) um but it'd be like the lesbian in her natural environment a study uh or like or even like sex like uh in the guise of medicine Mm -hmm. um and i thought that they looked slick yeah um yeah like back also i remember like Men's, like, it would be men's fitness magazines. Yeah. Instead of homosexual erotica. Yes. Yeah. Or um, the modeling magazines mm-hmm. where um, it would be for drawing from right. or the photo reference or, or drawing reference. Mm-hmm. Um, and it'd be like, yeah, like hot guys and like little, little things. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, we're, we're going to now demonstrate uh, Greek wrestling. Yes. yes. Greek wrestling. Oh my God. It's so hot. <laughs> I love going through eBay and finding those things. Yeah. Like, yeah. Oh my God. That's funny. Yeah. And the font of the, the title magazine is great thank you it's just really the, the ligatures are so interesting it's just it's really cool it definitely has like again without knowing what's inside you're like this is this is an art magazine they can mm-hmm. just tell from the from the front which is kind of great yeah so i mean about print though i mean do you feel pressure to go digital too for either financial or just emotional reasons um a little bit um but i also kind of don't care (laughs) um i've explored it on and off 
ever since the magazine started. Mm -hmm. Um, And I was even in contact with a company that hosts uh, digital magazines. um, And they suddenly stopped talking to me. And I wonder if they finally clicked the link in my email mm. signature and found out that's happened a lot like yeah. like you you're talking to a brand about maybe um sponsoring our drinks for a party mm-hmm. uh you get kind of far along in the conversation yeah. and then uh they click the link in your email signature and find out that it's not the kind of math that, that they thought <laughs> um which is fine yeah. i just wish people would like do their research and stuff you yeah know? well it's also i mean i call it the sex ghetto which is problematic in its own way but yeah like there's so many people who Sex sells, but not really. It's like that it's on their terms. It's a very specific kind of sex that sells. And so oftentimes brands only want to be associated with very narrow ideas about what it what they want to be associated with, which again, they're, they're rights, but it also does feel frustrating because it's like, you know, as an educator, it's like YouTube demonetizes our videos for education because we're because we're sex. And it's frustrating. Yeah. The, this is why I grind my teeth. Yeah. 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 <laughs> So you so you think print is still gonna be your your baby? Oh yeah, um, and and I worry about like um, what do you call it plagiarism and um, yeah, I don't know. Maybe I'm too much of a control freak. But, um, <laughs> it, uh, the things haven't lined up enough for it to be worthwhile, but yeah. I'm still open to it. Um, and I, I you know I want the magazine to be more accessible. Um, you know I think people take for granted too that that sexual companies um have a harder time making money Mm -hmm. um you know i can't advertise you know we got kicked off facebook so i can't use like facebook ad stuff Um, it it can be very difficult to get into spaces where you can reach people and you can Mm -hmm. reach customers um so i think doing digital could be a way to have a lower price point too Mm -hmm. um so that makes me you know want to do it um yeah, so we'll tough. see. I mean, the, the Girl Six One One is a highly illustrated book, so people were like, "Oh, is it an ebook?" I'm like, "It is, but it's a PDF. It's a like you have to like zoom in on the page mm. to be able to read the text, and then zoom out to and so it's like it's it's a way for me to make it cheaper for sure, and I'm happy to do that. But it definitely is a different ex- reading experience yeah. by far. And I'm I, again like maybe I'm old fashioned, but I love physical artifacts. I really do. And magazines, particularly because they're so endangered. Like you talking about growing up with Vogue in your house. Like that's a very specific kind of magazine. Mm-hmm. It's not just like Newsweeks that pile up and kind of you know are cheap paper. You mm-hmm. know, like Vogue was it's so graphic, so pretty so designed yeah but i think it that definitely speaks to this level of aesthetic that i think is really important i mean also it's 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 kind of devastating to say but i'm more free in uh what i can put out into the world in print than on digital platforms mm-hmm. on instagram every day we're being censored mm-hmm. got kicked off of facebook mm-hmm. can't live stream on twitter <laughs> um it's like I'm being uh, limited in so many ways on yeah. di- digital spaces. And um, the cost of printing is the only thing s- standing between, like, me and my readers mm-hmm. on, on the magazine. And I, I'm really free to do whatever I want in print. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's something to be put in, in high value definitely today. Yeah. Um, and, and it makes me want to encourage more people to get into print, too, and to, to spread their uh, – revolutionary ideas <laughs> <laughs> well that's the thing like i mean yes it's definitely more expensive but like the digital revolution like around like actual like print on demand like digital technologies mm-hmm. that allow us to create our own printing presses essentially mm-hmm. that's huge mm-hmm. and so it's like, even if you're self-publishing you can get your book or magazine printed and then distribute it yourself much like zines in the 90s but now on a mass scale yeah which is yeah. great yeah I'm reaching people through Instagram. Yeah, so I'm reaching people through a digital platform, but selling them a, a print media. Mm-hmm. Um, and every time I, I ship out to some place that's not L.A. or New York or, like, Paris or something, mm-hmm. I really get excited. I get excited about reaching people who don't have a Bayland around the corner, mm-hmm. uh, places where maybe it's harder to get information about um, safe sex or mm-hmm. consent or have conversations about kink. Mm-hmm. Um, so the more we can reach reach those places, I think, the better. Do you wholesale to bookstores, too? Yes. Awesome. Yeah. Well, there you go. Indie bookstores, if you're listening... In Carrie Math Magazine, that's pretty pretty exceptional stuff. So, how long have you been doing this now? 
A uh, couple of years. <laughs> yeah. How many issues do you have out? Um, we, I started with issue zero because I was afraid it was going to suck. Mm-hmm. And if it did, I would just say it never happened. <laughs> But I also can't do that anymore. <laughs> um, so there was issue zero, and now we're about to print issue seven. So That's eight. great. Awesome. Yeah. So if you uh, could change something about how you started this, however long ago you did, what would you change? Or um, poop on? Gosh. Nothing. Hmm. No, nothing. <laughs> I mean, there's a lot of embarrassing stuff in that first issue. I mm. modeled in the first issue. I took pictures in it. Mm-hmm. Um, it. It's I really pulled it together as best as I could. Um, the first issue, I only had enough money to print 50 copies. Mm. Um, I used a service called Mad Cloud, where you don't actually interact with any human beings. It's all, you know, you just submit the file and hope mm-hmm. for the best. Oh, wow. Um, and, you know, now we're up to like 1,200 um, uh copies per issue nice. um we're shipping all over the world like like the growth i've seen and the people i've met and worked with is like astounding and mm. inspiring and and so i wouldn't change a thing nice. <laughs> and do you have subscribers too or is it all i did a subscription for a little bit mm. um in the beginning i think people will be receiving their like last issue of that subscription mm. option um with this new issue mm. um I'm thinking about it. Um, it can be kind of tough to ad- administer, mm. um, but we, we might. Cool. We might offer it again. <laughs> That's awesome. So <laughs> what kind of model, you might kind of mentioned this, but I'm curious, like what kind of models do you want to reach out to you? Like who, or artists in general? Uh, where do I start? <laughs> <laughs> um, people of color. Um, people of color who want to buck any kind of like traditional or oppressive ideas that they like disagree with. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, like I've been in touch with some Latinx, um, women who, um, talk about the way they were brought up or even some of the, um, pushback they get from family still as adults and and wanting to support others who feel the same way Mm -hmm. and and to like append that or you know um I love I'd love to work with more disabled models and authors I've been lucky to work with several Mm -hmm. um I think visible disabilities need to be in porn in a way that's like like not a big deal. Mm-hmm. Basically, it's always like I want to represent people, but not make it about that representation. Right. Um, so you know, for somebody to like have great sex while disabled is like shouldn't be like a shocking idea. Right. <laughs> um, what else? Older models. Um, ever for I've been beating this drum for a very long time. Like older models, like older than forty, older than fifty. Like I really want you in the magazine having sex and like having a great time (laughs) um and maybe like engaging in a kink that that people don't associate with people older than 20 or something Mm -hmm. um or in an aesthetic that you don't think of is associated with somebody older than 20 Mm -hmm. you know um because i think the the representation can happen through more than just bodies right Mm -hmm. it can be done through the way that these bodies are depicted Mm -hmm. um you know, using like an aesthetic from Instagram for something that you don't see on Instagram. Mm -hmm. Um, and yeah, so I always like group sex scenes and, Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of kink that I think is misunderstood too. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, like needle play is misunderstood vor, Mm -hmm. um, the list goes on, you know, Mm -hmm. um, anything that's misunderstood. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, yeah. And I want to work with more trans people. Um, and I want the models to have more and more say over the like artistic direction and the aesthetic of things. Mm -hmm. And, um, do you work with the models to get them to the artistic level that you're looking for? Or do you kind of rely on them to kind of create the whole thing themselves or both? Um, it depends, you know, it's a personality thing. Um, I think sometimes models, they just want to model, you know, Mm -hmm. um, and they're excited about whatever idea I have. And Mm -hmm. I'm very conscious of the authority that I have. And I, sometimes I'm too 
cautious, you mm-hmm. know, I want everyone to have a real influence on what happens. But mm-hmm. I think sometimes we're all just kind of like, what do you think? Yeah. What do you think? Mm-hmm. And then nothing gets done. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm always trying to navigate that in a way that feels right. Mm-hmm. You know, how, how do you get things done while still be, being kind and allow giving people space to say they don't want to do something or that they want to pull the images all together? Right. Or, you know, I think... Um, scaling up our ethics is really interesting to mm. me. I want this company to grow. I want I want it to be huge. I want it to be an international name. Mm-hmm. And I still want to treat people well, mm-hmm. um, even if it means losing money mm-hmm. or even if it means setting back our print date or something mm-hmm. like that and um, being transparent about all of that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Is there anything that you're not allowed to show in the magazine? There are so many things I'm not allowed to show in the magazine. Yeah. There's, you know, those that list of yeah. things you're not supposed to show. Yeah. I think we've done all of them. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't looked at it in a while. You know, I feel like not caring about it is an important part. Mm. You know, it's like, yeah, I think like fist, fisting is on there probably. Mm-hmm. And like, like, oh, yeah, whatever. Like, Well, poop. yeah, like it's not those things aren't illegal. They're just things that. God, what's the name of the list? I was just talking to Jizzly about this. I know it when I see it. Listen. Yeah, it was basically um, like, yeah, so for those of you who don't know what we're talking about, there there was a lawyer at one point who said, like, during a lot of the indecency trials going on in, like, the 90s, who said, like, hey, porn, porn pr- producers, you might not want to include these things because they could be flagged as problematic. And the list was really re- kind of ridiculous. It was, like, interracial, transgender, transsexual was the word they used, fisting, uh, menstrual blood, like, all these different things that are very much a part of a lot of people's sex lives and this was just kind of uh, a list that this lawyer said like hey this is just a good idea to, t- to try and avoid I think it's the lawyer's name yeah it's the lawyer's name i can't remember his name ah, i feel I'll, I'll put it in the show notes but then then the government saw the list and then kind of picked it up and then we're like oh we'll use this so list like, oh that's good just just yeah. copy paste as this, as this great example and we're like no that's exactly the opposite of what we we're trying to do um so those things aren't illegal to do or to even photograph it's just that distributors are often now afraid of those things mm-hmm. because they're afraid that the government's paying extra attention. So like credit card processors and stuff like that will threaten to pull you if you have, you know, X, Y, Z stuff in your, in your films or, or pictures. And weirdly, I think that the name of the magazine is like saves our butt sometimes. Mm-hmm. I don't think that we come up in these, I mean, I don't know how they, how, how they mm-hmm. like capital T, they right. like finds people, but, um, We've been lucky so far. Um, well, also, like, I think the fact that you're not all digital might actually help there, yeah. too. It's like, you know, people have to really seek you out and then want to screw with you as opposed to on the Internet where you can just do a, a search of terms and then you have all the things that you <laughs> Maybe the fact that our SEO isn't that good is actually like, a good thing. <laughs> you're like, um, under the radar. It's like the new vo- form of being underground, right? Yeah. Which is weird. But, I mean, it does make math feel very cool, right? It's like mm-hmm. if you if you know what the magazine is, then you're kind of hip and if you like that's it does have a certain amount of street cred that it would be harder if you if everything was just posted on Pornhub you know yeah that's yeah. interesting I'll embrace it thank you <laughs> Good. so for people who are interested in like the, I mean you had I'm really glad that you shared kind of your story because I think that's what I really want orgasm listeners to understand is like how all the people who do this stuff for a living they they made this stuff work themselves or they had a passion. So like for other like baby pornographers out there, baby erotica publishers or something, do you have any advice for how to get into this industry or how to protect yourself in the industry? I think it's the same kind of advice I give young artists where um, there can be so much pressure nowadays, especially with Instagram and seeing all this work out in the world and being really intimidated by how far other people around you have gotten Mm -hmm. and thinking you're the first thing you make has to be of the same caliber has Mm -hmm. to be so slick and complete and Mm -hmm. like in Gagosian or whatever. And, and, and I, I really encourage people to just make, make the stuff they're excited about, make the things that they wish there was more about in the world and don't worry too much about, about that. You know, Mm -hmm. um, I think we can really stifle ourselves so much, um, and it keeps some really amazing voices from reaching like the world, mm-hmm. you know, and even if it all, your work only reaches a few people, like you could have a significant impact on somebody's life and, and encourage them to, um, put their, uh, perspective out into the world. Um, so I would say 
just ma- just keep making the stuff. Um, I think that that's the key. And I think people find each other. People find the work that they're excited about or they find the people who share the sort of uh, worldview that, that they long to see more of. Mm. You know, we find each other. Mm. Um, and I think if you put your little bat signal out there, like, it'll it'll work out. Nice. And don't stop. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. So where can people find math? Where can people pitch you if they want to model for you? Yeah. Um, so like we mentioned, uh, we've got some retailers. Um, like we just got into Babeland and Good Vibrations um, on their website and in their stores. Um, uh, there's a list of all the retailers on our website. Uh, it's math-mag.com, um, where you can also just buy the magazine and we ship everywhere. Um, I also just added a bunch of cool merch to our site. Nice. We have like a cum rag, <laughs> cum towel. <laughs> Those things are the best merch. I've, I've been getting a lot of them Really? Lately. Yeah, well, because I, I use them. I, I totally <laughs> use them. It's like, it's like I could have like some sort of like flashlight or something that I never use, but having a cum rag is very convenient. And you feel like really like legit. It's like, <laughs> like I have sex, but like... I'm also prepared. <laughs> yes. You know? Yeah. You know? It's, it's very sexy when somebody very... arrives to my home with, like, the little gear bag. And, yeah. <laughs> and the, the nice things that where it's like, oh, clearly you you put some forethought into this. Like, For real. Like, rag, you know, all the stuff, you know, makes you feel good. It makes good. a difference. It does. <laughs> um, so, cum rags. <laughs> branded cum rags. Um, and, and magazines. And um, we've got a blog there, too, where we'll, we'll talk about events in the area. We try to cover some international stuff, too too so you can kind of i don't know know about our community a little bit more too nice wonderful Mackenzie. it has been a delight talking to you thank you so much yeah yay and that is it for this week's episode of Artgasm. Thank you, as always, for joining me on this journey into art and sexuality. One thing, just a little correction from the interview, um, that thing that I could not remember the name of the list, it's the Cambria List, C-A-M-B-R-I-A, the Cambria List, named after the lawyer who was hired by, I think, Vivid Entertainment to create a list of things that you might not want to put in your porn. Well, that's the list that they use now, the FBI uses to track down porn, Uh Fully consensual, fully legal porn. Uh, when they want to try and limit distrib- distribution, that's what the list that they look at. It's a it's a fucked up world that we live in, folks. It's a fucked up world. Uh, anyway, so if you're interested in learning more about Math Magazine, go to math-mag.com. Not only can you get a little bit more information about how to buy the magazine, but you can also sign up on their mailing list. And if you sign up on the mailing list, you get the invitations to those release parties, which is super exciting. So if you're in the Brooklyn area, I know that issue number seven is releasing really soon so if you want to go to a sexy party filled with sexy people talking about sexy things uh you should get on that mailing list so you can find out all the details about the math magazine issue seven release party and then you'll just stay abreast of other things understanding that you know with instagram being all ridiculous and facebook being all ridiculous that it's sometimes hard to even follow the artists that you love because our accounts are getting shut down for being sexually explicit or even just for intimating that we might be sexually explicit. Again, if you follow me on Patreon, you might know that I am behind the adult wall, even though the entire content of this podcast is obviously just talking. So, you know, neat. So anyway, uh, but you can follow her on math at Math Magazine. You can follow me on all the social medias by going to uh, Instagram. I'm Allison underscore Moon. That's Allison with two L's. Uh, you can also find me on Twitter at Hey Allie Moon. You can find the website is orgasmcast.com. And if you do want to support me on Patreon, that would be super, super cool. You can find me on Patreon at patreon.com slash artgasm. And there you'll hear a back episodes. I'm going to start doing more interviews, uh, special kind of one-off interviews, just kind of shoot the shit conversations inspired by my friend Sunny Megatron with prior guests so if you're kind of curious as to what these guests that I've recorded with earlier are up to these days that's a great way of you being able to kind of notice and see what's going on and it's also a great way to be able to support me on a regular basis and hear more episodes kind of like the monologue at the the top of the show hopefully if you enjoy that kind of thing my my thoughtful uh sweet compassionate monologues about art and sex. If that's the kind of thing that you're into, you can hear more by going to patreon.com slash artgasm. As always, thank you for listening and please do subscribe on your favorite subscription device and 
Leave a review if you are so inclined. It really does help. And buy your tickets to Sketchfest, to the Hound Hall podcast. Buy your tickets to the Mystery Box show. Either way, uh, I want to see you and your beautiful faces and connect with you and sell you books and talk to you about sex stuff and art stuff and all those things. So do find me and let's chat. All right, until next time, thanks for joining me.